Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with me tonight. I'd like to talk about what's going on in New Zealand regarding the ultra-fast broadband network that's the fiber to the home network that is being built currently. My name is Fernando Beltran. I'm with the University of Auckland. So in this talk, uh, I'd like to give you some basic uh, information about the um, telecommunication market in New Zealand then discuss the building blocks model, which is the regulatory framework that is proposed by the New Zealand uh, amended telecommunication act, explain the basic two um, ways in which if this will happen and uh, discuss two things, the incentives in the model and uh, one particular particularity that's the optimal time of investment. So New Zealand decided uh, at, uh, in 2009 to um, go public uh, to um, the government decided to, to um, intervene the market given that the broadband was not was not reaching population so um, it called for a public private uh, partnership in the government and uh, three four companies who were competing for uh, becoming uh, fiber um, platforms in different areas of the country, uh, with one awarded almost 70% and the others with the uh, best share, as you can see on the screen. So the targets for this project is basically to take uh, the uh, broadband in at least uh, three different modalities to almost 100% and to put New Zealand as one of the leading countries in uh, fiber penetration. At, uh, on the 31st of March this year, um, 281 towns and cities have been covered with fiber to the home. Uh, the availability is um, for one and one million, uh, 150, 15,000 businesses and homes connected with an uptake of almost 64%. The retail uh, level or sector, uh, companies that purchase uh, fiber from the fiber providers is uh, shown here with a couple of leaders and uh, smaller companies and a large number of um, a smaller uh, ISPs which make up 13%. So over the last 10 years, uh, as you can see, there's been an increase in the total fixed uh, broadband connections. Uh, and uh, this is reaching almost 34%. Uh, the, 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 the indicator is about 35%, 35 uh, lines, uh, broadband lines per 100 um, inhabitants. Uh, also fixed wireless has been increasing, which is an important thing for, especially for the rural areas. Uh, the consumption uh, is also uh, remarkable. And the copper lines have been um, decreasing. In fact, well, that's the other, the, the other side of the story, the withdrawal of copper in different parts of the, of the country. In terms of uh, how New Zealanders uh, connect to the internet, you, you can see how fiber has been reaching almost 60% of all connections with a healthy share of fixed wireless and copper being on the, on re, on the retreat uh, and the um, cable, a uh, very small portion. The, the investment uh, in fiber is um, as you can see, quite uh, the number of connections, which corresponds to the investment on the on fiber has been steadily growing uh, with all copper, different copper uh, modality modes uh, de decreasing, especially uh, ADSL and with fixed wireless also increasing over the last five years. Investment uh, was uh, a peak, uh, last year, but has been sustained over the last uh, eight, nine years with uh, some mobile investment, investment in mobile, 
Um, but that's basically the uh, what um, the cellular companies have done under the smaller portion of the USB initiative, which is called the Rural Burden, Burden Initiative. So in the OECD, New Zealand stands with other countries like uh, Finland and Norway, Portugal, with uh, um, about 50% of fiber representing 50% total broadband, still a bit uh, lagging behind Japan, Korea, and Sweden and other countries, as you can see. So the story in New Zealand is kind of a back to the future. Hundred more than hundred years ago, New Zealand Post the Telegraph Department was created, and uh, in 1987, Telecom New Zealand was divested from the postal services, and three years later it was sold. So all for over 110 years, uh, almost 110 years, uh, government owned the company. But what that was not true anymore after that. 2001 first telecommunication act, real law. And uh, 10 years later, the UFB ultra fast broadband initiative, which is what I'm we're talking about that called for the split of Telecom New Zealand into two companies, Spark, which is the mobile company and Corus that retain the infrastructure. So from 2010, because of the private, public private, pu public -private partnership, and the infusion of um, money from the government. Basically, government became again an owner of the network uh, all over the country. So um, three years ago, the act was reviewed and it was decided that a new regulatory um, framework would be in place, new regulation would be in place by the Commerce Commission from 2021 on. So, um, 2018, uh, the act was passed. It's actually an amendment, and it was defined that the service to be regulated is called FLAS, that's Fiber Fixed Line Access Services. FLA is a telecommunication service that enables access to an interconnection with a regulated, regulated fiber service provider's fiber network. And uh, the candidates to becoming FLAS, and it's basically a position already, uh, things like voice services, bitstream, uh, pawn services, and bundle uh, passive optical network services, point-to-point -point services, transport and co-location and interconnection. The BBM model has been proposed and is the one that will be, um, that the Com Commerce Commission will be, the regulator will be using. It's a tool for spreading or amortizing the expenditure of the regulated firm over time, so as to ensure a path of revenue or prices, which has the property that the present value of firms allow revenue is equal to the present value of firm expenditure. Um, and it is, consists of two equations, the revenue equation and the asset-based uh, asset uh, roll forward equation. Um, the components are the maximum allowed revenue, which equals the rate of return on capital times the regulatory asset base and the operating expenditure, depreciation, and capital expenditure as part of the asset based role for equation. So those, those would be equations one and two. Um, the BBM will cap the revenue and um, the, 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 the asset based. Uh, and the asset base will be also roll, roll, uh, roll forward. Regulation is to be achieved by using two mechanisms, the price quality paths and the information disclosure determinations. Under PQ, the regulator is trying to determine maximum revenue and a price the regulator operator is uh, allowed to earn from its uh, class fix, a fiber fixed line, uh, um, access services, and under ID, information disclosure, regulated providers must disclose information about their class. Who will be regulated? Well, Corus by both the PQ and ID mechanisms and the other local fiber companies, the other three by ID only. So what about incentives in the building blocks model? Well, 
start with financial capital maintenance for the, the scenario where incentives are absent. And that what that implies is that the net present value of the profit stream of the firm is zero. So if we are at the beginning of period T, um, the question that the paper addresses with the help of Bigger 2004 is, is if incentives uh, provided where. <laughs> so let's say a deviation from SCM is allowed, uh, allow higher revenue. So allowing higher revenues through equation one or a deviation uh, from the FCM scenario, scenario by intervening the difference between actual CAPEX, IT, and forest, forecast CAPEX, IT in the equation two. So assuming that, so let's think of this scenario, assuming that future time T, the firm will cease to exist and the outstanding funds will be paid to invest, investors, basically the level of, um, of um, role, role, uh, the level of uh, the, the asset based uh, T. Uh, so the profit stream would look like this as found in the paper. So what this means that is that the uh, profit do not, uh, the profit depend on the sum of these two, any of the two deviations, the sum of the deviations on either on, on uh, question one or question two. So in the end, really it doesn't matter where the regulator would intervene, um, the effect on the profit is the same. That's number one. Number two, the optimal time of investment is based on paper uh, work by Borman and Brunecraft. Uh, suppose that what they do is uh, assuming that the firm faces regulated price before investment is done and regulated price after investment is done. And they post a expression for maximizing the regulated discounted profit VR to find the optimal investment time. So this is telling us basically that it can be written in two um, parts, depending on the time we're looking for, T moment as a, vari a decision variable, uh, less the um, cost of uh, investment. So the assumption is that a post-investment regulated price is defined as a, as a markup over the anti-investment regulated price that depends on the size of the investment, the maximum capacity, the weighted average costs of capital, and the regula regulator's additional margin and cost of capital. This, this is the, the instrument that we are allowing the regulator to, um, to use. And if that's the case, then, then we are assuming that the post, uh, post investment regulated price is equal to the uh, anti investment price plus a, an, a, a uh, term that where the regulator is allowing an additional march in cost of capital, uh, thinking that um, the deviation above has less detrimental consequences than a deviation below. And after solving the equation uh, here and doing some further simplifications, basically what we find is this relation between the optimal time of investment and that extra amount of um, return that the regulator is playing with. So the interesting thing is that we have two uh, limits to boundaries here, but also the behavior in the time, uh, how it depends on that is that it, it brings a, um, we, we are able to determine at least the shape uh, that uh, the optimal time changes, but also the other finding comes in the conclusions. So UFP has re been regarded as a successful infrastructure endeavor. The government decided to adopt PBM to regulate the providers of wholesale fiber services, and in particular, chorus with the two mechanisms explained. The deviations from F FCM uh, to bring on desired incentives can be either by uh, means of the revenue equations or by means of the asset-based uh, role forward equation. Um, 
still need to explore the power incentives, which I didn't mention, but you can find something in the paper. And finally, the change to BBM regulation may potentially reduce the investment for colors to delay investment compared to the case of uh, alternative uh, total service long run uh, incremental cost regulation. Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much.